Tom, as, a, as just a short review, uh, what, based on the prophecies out of the Vatican that were hidden for all these generations, are they anticipating with the final pope? Well, the, the idea among both Catholics and Protestant scholars is that he will be the final pope. He is uh, the one who is going to be residing over the Vatican as it enters into the Great Tribulation period. And there's also the belief among even some of the Catholic mystics that he might be a false pope, an anti-pope, somebody who helps give rise to the Antichrist. As you may know, we have a new pope. Uh, March 13th, Pope Francis came into power. I made a video, this video, on the very next day. Uh, I actually made it on the same day, but I uploaded it the next day as it takes time to edit. Um, it has, at this point, 171,000 views. Uh, it's a very big subject. It is extra-biblical prophecy. However, it is very interesting for those of you who want to stay up to date on prophecy, eschatology, end times events. I believe that this is connected. Uh, what I've done here in this video is I have taken uh, two episodes of Sid Roth. Uh, I have taken out all of the advertising and I have put them together to shorten it for you so that you can have this information. What it is is Sid Roth of the show It's Supernatural is interviewing the uh, two authors, Tom Horn, and, uh, Tom Horn and Chris Putnam, uh, who created the book uh, that foretold of this prophecy and pretty much revealed it to the world called Petrus Romanus. They have a new book called Ex of Vaticana. Um, and it, just here, here you go. Uh, this continues. Uh, this is pretty major news. Uh, please get this into your hands, the hands of your friends and family who do not know what time it is. The time is late. Okay, this is the only time you're going to see me in this video. I will just finish up with the uh, presentations. All credit goes to Sid Roth, Chris Putnam, and Tom Horn. Uh, I will put the links to their products. Uh, there are books and CDs and uh, DVDs and whatnot uh, that they are offering, but I did edit all that out because it just it makes the whole video twice as long. So um, links for that are below because they do deserve credit for their work. Uh, I will also ha have a link to this video if you have not seen it. Uh, this will be uh, a link linked at the end of the video and also below. Uh, enjoy and uh, thank you. Oh, welcome to my world where it's naturally supernatural. Buried in the library of the Vatican was an ancient 900 year old prophecy which listed every pope for the next 112 popes. Well, we've had 111, and every single pope that had a prophetic word, and they all had it, that's what happened in their life. Amazing, stunning accuracy. Would you like to know what it says about the 112th Pope? I'll tell you one thing. It says he will be the Pope for the final judgment. You know, Tom and Chris, your best-selling books, you made major predictions. I mean, uh, you guys like to live a little dangerously. I mean, you went all out on the limb, and you stated, you predicted that in March of 2012, the Pope would resign for health reasons, and let's be candid, <laughs> they missed it. Did you? Well, at first, actually, we thought we might have. Uh, now we learned that, in fact, we did not. We made a prediction that Benedict would retire in either March or April of 2012, citing health reasons. Uh, when that date came and went and no activity uh, had transpired, we moved to the second part in our prediction, which we also made in 2012, that at a minimum he would retire before the end of 2013. Now we've learned, by the way, from the editor of the El Observatory Romano, which is the Vatican's owned mm. official media outlet, that in fact, Pope Benedict officially resigned at the end of March 2012 privately to a handful of cardinals who held it in a strict reserve, in a confidence. It couldn't be told even to other cardinals 
This happened last year. He made it official in 2013. So in a very supernatural, dramatic way, we were actually right in both instances. But speaking about being right, I am fascinated about this 900-year-old prophecy uh, from this Saint uh, Malachi. Uh, tell me about these prophecies. Well, the prophecy of the popes was allegedly given to Saint Malachi Morgair, an Irish saint, in 1139 A.D. Now, the way that this story is told, Malachi made a pilgrimage to Rome to see the pope, and right outside of the city of Rome, he had a vision of all the popes up until the tribulation period. So he wrote down a series of short Latin phrases for 112 popes, except the last one, which is quite a bit uh, more detailed. The, the last prophecy, the prophecy for the very next pope, says, in the extreme persecution of the Holy Roman Church, there will sit Peter the Roman, who will nurse the sheep in many tribulations. When they are finished, the city of seven hills will be destroyed, and the dreadful judge will judge his people. Now, I've gotten to know the two of you, and you uh, are, are such, Chris, a, a, a theologian, so after truth. I, you've analyzed all of these uh, prophecies for all, all 112 popes. Tell me one, pull one out about one pope that uh, you felt was amazing. And, but, but even beyond that, were they all on the money or not? Well, Sid, I'll tell you, when I, when I began to investigate this prophecy, I was not predisposed to believe it. I'm, I'm not a Catholic, I'm a Protestant, but I, I wanted to take a critical, skeptical kind of look at it. Now, some of them seem a little vague to me. Um, some of them seem to speak to the coat of arms of a pope or events during his papacy. But the ones that are accurate, the ones that make kind of a risky prediction are so accurate that I really could not dismiss it. And I think it does beg us to take it seriously. For instance, there was one prophecy in particular that grabbed my attention. This was for Benedict XV. Now, he was pope from 1914 to 1922. And the Latin phrase was religio depopulata. Now, that means religion depopulated in English. So what happened between 1914 and 1922? We had World War I, which is devastating to mm -hmm. Europe, devastating to the Catholic Church. But to add insult to injury, you had the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, where 200 million people left the church to join the Communist Party. Those that didn't leave, Lenin targeted them specifically to eliminate them. So religion was depopulated probably more than any other period in history up until that time. And this prophecy nailed it. Now, why do you say that this will be the last pope? It's the last one on Malachi's list. And, and I just cited the, the prediction for this pope. It says, in the extreme persecution, the, the, the tribulation, the dreadful judge will judge the people. So it, it really does sound like the end times. And it matches the book of Revelation in some pretty compelling ways in chapter 17, which also speaks of a seven-hilled city. Uh, I'm going to tell you something. At first, when I heard about this, I didn't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. But after talking to them on the phone, looking at their research, understanding their brilliance in their respective fields, I feel that what you're about ready to hear will change your paradigm for end times forever. For instance, they investigated secret files from the Vatican that shows that the Vatican has been in communication and been researching aliens from other planets that strongly affect your whole understanding of the last days. We'll be right back after this word. You know, the Bible warns about great delusion because people uh, won't have a love for the truth. They're going to accept lies in the last days. Uh, and I believe that what you're about to hear will totally change your paradigm on the end times. Now, Tom, I believe you were hand-picked by God for doing your part of the research team of the, of the last days. Uh, now, shortly after you became a believer, you died. Tell me about it. Yes, I did. I had been seeking God. I was a young believer. I went home one night. I clumb into bed. The next thing I know, I'm standing in front of a brilliant white light. Somehow I know that I'm in front of the Lord. 
and he's told me, I'm, you're, you know, he's told me some things and now he's telling me I'm not going to remember, but it's time for me to return. The next thing I know, I'm falling from the heavens. I land on the bed in my bedroom. I set up real fast. I breathed in very deeply <gasps> like that. And I find my wife sitting beside me. She's bawling her eyes out. Long story short is she had woke up in the middle of the night, found me dead, did various things to, um, you know, verify to herself that I was dead. Now, um, I started asking questions. Why would the Lord have showed me something and then told me that I wasn't going to remember what it was? That confused me. Uh, I happened to be reading through the Bible at that time and uh, was in Job 33. First time I was ever reading through the Bible in my life and I'm praying, Lord, why would you show me something and then tell me I'm not going to remember what it was? When all of a sudden off the pages from the 33rd chapter of the book of Job, I read these words, in the nighttime, in deep sleep, in slumbering upon the bed, then God seals the instructions of the righteous within them to hide pride from man. Now, Tom found after 25 years of being an Assembly of God pastor, a family secret. Tell me about that. Yes, well, I actually remember the first event when I was a kid, uh, waking up in the middle of the night, my sister screaming, terrified. We all go running to her room, and as a kid, Mom never would let me know what had happened that day. Years later, I discovered that that was the first night in which she began experiencing what many people in the secular world call alien abduction. She woke up, small bulbous headed, gray, three little gray men standing next to her bed speaking in a gibberish that she couldn't understand. And uh, that when she screamed, they, they vaporized. They literally just disappeared as if they were uh, more amorphous or shadowy, if you will, made out of smoke. They just disappeared. And uh, that stayed with me once I knew that. Well, here I am, I'm a pastor, right? I'm 25 years a pastor. I pastored large churches, I have responsibilities in the community. Right. Nobody can I talk to about this, you know, in the 70s. Uh, and then little by little, information began coming to me that ultimately made me conclude, Sid, that we were talking about a demonic phenomenon. Why? Well, first, first of all, because of the malevolent behavior, but more importantly, and this is really the crux of it, once we learned that by taking the name of Jesus Christ over these powers, we could stop the activity permanently. And from the day that my sister gave her life to the Lord, that activity stopped in its tracks, and that illustrated to this old preacher, we were talking here about demons, not aliens from another world. Okay, Chris, you are an evangelical you're a theologian. Uh, you've been trained in these areas. You specialized in grad school uh, on Catholic and Protestant reformers. Uh, and God really prepared you also for this project. Uh, tell me about, because you have prophetic dreams, tell me about one. Well, Sid, you know, I got radically saved. And I had been into a lot of this weird stuff in my past, and the Lord completely changed my thinking. And, you know, as my values changed and, and I started to get into God's Word, He did give me a dream. He gave me a vision that He was going to use me to minister in areas that most Christians are afraid to talk about. And between the two of them, you can see why God put a perfect research team together. But now, the question that I have, what have you uncovered from records in the Vatican about aliens? I mean, I, 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 it blows my mind that they're even researching such a subject as this. Well, the, the records in the Vatican go back centuries. Actually, I, I wrote two chapters of history concerning uh, the Vatican's interest in extraterrestrials. They have a whole theology developed around what they call the principle of plentitude, meaning anything that God could do, He would do. So they consider the existence of aliens an inevitable consequence of, of God's omnipotence. Now, you, you've actually researched with Vatican astronomers. Uh, what did they tell you? Yeah, it's extraordinary. We even had the opportunity to go to Mount Graham in Arizona, which is where their Vatican Astronomical Technology Telescope, called that, where it's at, where the, uh, the Vatican's astronomers study the uh, deep space. And um, in the course of doing that, getting permission through the Arizona State University to go there to meet mm -hmm. with their astronomers, the Jesuits who are there, 
we also got access to top astronomers that work in Rome, including um, an astronomer by the name of Guy Cosmonago. He's one of the top astronomers for the Vatican. What, what was the major thing you got from you had interview with him? Oh, well, two major things. One, uh, he says um, without apology that very soon the nations of the world are going to look to the aliens for their salvation. Now, when you make a comment like Did that... Did you it, just hear what he said? Does that show you how fast things are moving and how we're really in the last of the last days? And then, of course, you want to get behind that, right? You want to find out where are they coming from. So he agreed to be interviewed five times from Rome uh, and then gave us documents which are not available to the public that outline what much of the inner thinking of the highest level theologians and astronomers at the Vatican believe now, uh, including the idea that Jesus might be the son of a star child. Now, when we ask him what is a star child, right, right they're talking about an alien intelligence from another world and that the, um, the birth of Jesus Christ, the virgin birth, was in fact comparable to an abduction scenario in which these aliens used the Virgin Mary to create Jesus. And this is one of the ways in which they're combining the, 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 the idea that we are soon to be visited by an alien savior from another world. Hold that thought. Wait till you find out about the Vatican astronomer saying he's operating with Project Lucifer. Okay, I promised you we would find out uh, the, 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 this great Catholic astronomer, the number one, is operating with something called Project Lucifer. What is that? Well, up on top of Mount Graham in Arizona, there's, a, there's an observatory complex. It consists of three very high-powered telescopes. One is the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope. There's a, there's a radio telescope, and then there's one called the Large Binocular Telescope. This is the most powerful telescope in the world. In fact, they told us they can get better images of space than the Hubble Space Telescope can. Hmm. Now, attached to this telescope is an infrared camera named Lucifer which is really a, a kind of a, a, an odd name um, <laughs> think so. for a camera. And, you know, from the information that we gathered, this thing was named by the Max Planck Institute and some German astronomers. But the Vatican is part of this conglomerate up there, that, mm -hmm. that, and they're all working together. Now, what this instrument's used for is astrobiology, for looking for exoplanets, looking for other worlds. And uh, the infrared spectrum is also very useful for seeing things that can't be seen with the naked eye. And many UFO researchers have noted that you can see a lot of ships and entities that you normally can't see. Tell me about what the Vatican astronomers are telling you, or what other experts, I mean, you, you had a research team. Right. Tell me a few of the things they're telling Well, first of all, the day that we spent it, uh, uh, on Mount Graham, the entire day there, we had the Jesuits speaking to us face to face. Mm -hmm. We also had systems engineers. It was astonishing the access that they gave us. And one of the things we found amazing in the use of the Lucifer device and even the other telescopes is how commonly the astronomers spoke of UFOs. We, we were just taken back by the fact that it was almost a nuisance to them I, I, that there are so many. I, I have to tell you, <laughs> uh, UFOs, I mean, I think that's like science fiction, to be quite candid with you. But I told my staff about this interview, and one of the staff members said when he was 12 or 13 years old, he saw a UFO, and they visited him and talked to him. I mean, and that's just a small group of people. And uh, statistics say uh, one out of two people in America believe in UFOs, unidentified flying objects. Uh, and we're hearing now reports all over the world. Well, and a lot of Christians have saw them, too. My wife and I were crossing over a mountain one time when a circular silvery device 
dropped down from the heavens, shot around, done all kinds of things we couldn't explain. We didn't know if it was an angel, a demon, or whatever it was, but it certainly was what people describe as UFOs. And so the phenomenon, to me, is certainly real. Then, of course, you begin defining what it is. Well, to the Vatican and to the astronomers... But wait a second, it's demonic. Why would the Vatican be studying this? Yeah, well... Not only are they studying it, uh, Caroldo Balducci, who was the spokesman for the Vatican, he was their official mouthpiece concerning the alien presence, not just the reality of aliens on other worlds, but an alien presence that is here on Earth now. Is You can go to YouTube and watch his shows on Italian television when he spoke for the church and said that the church was using its embassies around the world to compile information, a case study, if you will, on what the aliens are doing on Earth now. So the belief system is deep, regardless of what you or I might make out of it. And i got to tell you, especially when it comes to alien abduction, I am convinced that we are talking about about demonic activity, not intelligences from another world, maybe from another dimension. And they're moving in and out of our reality. They certainly have a conspiratorial uh, plan that might even involve human hybridity. There's a lot to the study. That's why it took us thousands of pages and six investigators, and I had to bring a theologian on <laughs> to make sure that I didn't get off track, right? But, uh, but, but what they're saying to us now is it's going to affect Christian belief. There is a professor for the Pope's uh, uh, University in Rome, and uh, uh, he is a very highly respected intellectual. Uh, his last name is Tanzniti, and he has written a paper now in which he is saying that very soon, not, a, not right in the beginning, we won't have to um, deny our Christian faith in the beginning. But there is information coming from another world, and once it is confirmed, it is going to require a rereading of the gospel as we know it. And that's the kind of information that we are receiving from the highest levels of Vatican intelligentsia. Where's this headed, in your opinion, after all this research? I think it's headed towards an imminent great deception. Uh, I, think, I think they either know something or they suspect something, and that's why they're preparing the Catholic faithful. The, 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 and, of course, the Vatican has reached beyond Catholics, um, but they're trying to prepare the world. Let me tell you something. This is information that you must digest in light of the Scriptures. But the most important thing is not what we're talking about. The most important thing is that you know God. Whether he comes in one minute or whether he comes in 20 years, you must know him for yourself. Religion is good if it helps you know God, but if it's an end in itself, it means nothing. The only way you can know God is step one. He's already done everything he's ever going to do for you. His Messiah was sent to earth to die, the Son of the living God, and rise from the dead. And all of your sins and all of your diseases were put upon him, and by his wounds you were healed. Make Jesus your Lord with your mouth. You don't need a formal prayer. You say, Jesus, I make you my Lord. Live inside of me. Forgive me for all of my sins. And this is what the Bible says. It's, you say it's too good. I agree. It is too good. Take the goodness of God. Taste and see that the Lord is good. He's good. I'm interrupting this show with a special announcement. We have a new pope, and he's St. Francis. His parents are Italian. According to the Malachi prophecy, the last pope would be Roman. Also, he's the first Jesuit pope, and next week you'll find out how the Jesuits are involved in the last days. Hello, it's Sid Roth here. Welcome to my world, where it's naturally supernatural. Last week, we found out about these amazing prophecies buried in the Vatican. 900 years ago, what would happen to each pope all the way up to the last pope? On this show, we're going to continue, and we're going to talk about the Vatican's secret plans for welcoming an alien god with a small g under the reign 
of the last pope. <laughs> but last week we talked about the Saints Malachi. And Chris, I have to ask you, does the Pope know about these prophecies? Do the Cardinals know about these prophecies? What do they think of them? Well, so there's actually a, a lot of evidence that they do take it very seriously. In fact, Pope Pius XII, who was the Pope during World War II, he actually produced a documentary film about himself, and the title of the film is the Malachi motto for his papacy, Angelic Shepherd. He actually titled the film after the Malachi prophecy's prediction for him. So he not only endorsed it, he claimed it. Okay, Tom, as, a, as just a short review, uh, what, based on the prophecies out of the Vatican that were hidden for all these generations, are they anticipating with the final pope? Well, the, the idea among both Catholics and Protestant scholars is that he will be the final pope. He is uh, the one who is going to be residing over the Vatican as it enters into the Great Tribulation period. And there's also the belief among even some of the Catholic mystics that he might be a false pope, an anti-pope, somebody who helps give rise to the Antichrist. Let me tell you something. Judaism, Christianity, and other religions have focused on the year in 2012. You know, that remember the Mayan prediction, the end of the world in 2012? So everyone's discounted all of that, but that's not exactly what the prediction said. What did it say? In the conferences where I spoke last year, I kept telling people, don't say it's the end of the world. That's not what the Maya said. That's not what the Aztec said. That's not what the Cherokee Indians said, all of whose calendar rolled over at the end of 2012. What was it that they were saying? They were saying 2012 was the end of an era, and 2013 marks a new dispensation. Now, the Maya said some things that were very interesting. They said it would be marked by the emergence of two great male figures who would emerge upon the earth. They sound very much like they're talking about the false prophet right. and the Antichrist. Uh, they talked about their god, Bolyan Yakteku, the spirit of it coming up from out of the underworld. Now, what does this god do? He guards the bones and the seed of the giants that are in the underworld, and that that spirit would begin to rise in the year 2013, giving birth even to a new form of humanity. You're talking about what I've read about and pondered so many times in the Bible. Maybe you've read this about the Nephilim, where the sons of God cohabited with the uh, daughters of humans and produced great giants. That's what it sounds like That's to me. That's exactly what I'm talking about, and furthermore, turn of the century preachers, including Jonathan Edwards, marked the year 2012 to 2016 as the date when the false prophet and the Antichrist would appear. Dozens of Protestant reformers marked these years hundreds of years ago. Not only that, uh, and you appreciate this with your Jewish ministries, the Zohar, one of the most important books of Jewish Kabbalah ever written. It is accepted in traditional Judaism as coming from God. Uh, it's not all from God, I can tell you as a fact, but it's an interesting uh, situation that it talks about. In a section of the Zohar called Signs Heralding Mashiach, the coming of the Messiah, they marked the year 5773, which in the Jewish calendar began in September 2012, and comes through into this year, 2013, and said that was the time. In fact, much of the prophecy sounds almost identical to the prophecy of the popes. It is a time that will lead to the destruction of Rome, and more importantly, they said, at that time, Messiah will begin making himself known to the nations of the world. This 700 years ago prophesied that between 2012 to 2013, the emergence of the Messiah would appear on earth, almost an identical parallel to cultures around the world that for thousands of years saw these dates specifically as the time when the end times would begin. Speaking of end times, many of you are familiar with uh, the apparitions of Mary and Fatima and people going there and being healed, but it's not exactly the way we've been told, is it, Chris? No, it's not. What would happen if there was a massive UFO sighting? Well, what happened in Fatima, Portugal in 1917 was really just that, in my opinion. Now, up to 70,000 people gathered in a field, supposedly to see an apparition of the Virgin Mary. But if you go and read the descriptions of what people call the miracle of the sun, they actually describe seeing a gray, silvery disk. 
rotating around in the sky and, and, and kind of putting a cascade of colors, like a rainbow of colors. And so it really, in 1917, no one had vocabulary of words like flying saucer. Right. But that's exactly what it sounds like they're describing to me. Yeah, I've always thought Mary just appeared in the sky. It, it really wasn't Mary at all. They're talking about a sphere or a silver disk. And, and that same a flying saucer, let's call it for what it is, demonic, according to my notes here, in 1950, Pope Pius XII saw the same thing. Explain. Well, what's interesting about the Marian dogmas and all these things that we don't see in the Bible is that the, the theology has sort of escalated over time. Now, in 1950, Pope Pius saw a sphere over the Vatican Gardens, the same sort of thing that you hear about at Fatima. Now, this sighting of this opaque sphere, flying saucer, you know, UFO, inspired him to define a new doctrine that all Catholics have to believe, and that is that Mary ascended into heaven just like Jesus does in Acts chapter 1. Wait till you find their research of what the Vatican is ready to announce in reference to end time. Bible prophecy and in reference to aliens coming to planet Earth. We'll be right back. As far as I'm concerned, I'm being blown out of the water, and, and a lot of my end time thinking is uh, the whole paradigm is changing in light of the Bible prophecy that you're, you're bringing to us. Tell me about the Vatican Conference uh, of a gathering of scientists to discuss extraterrestrial activity. Certainly. In 2009, the Vatican sponsored an astrobiology conference. And now, that means? That is the study of life in space. Now, what makes that interesting is that we don't really know of any life in space, yet our universities have you know, programs where you can study this. They had the top secular scientists in the world come to Rome for this conference in 2009, we're talking about, you know, atheists, um, you know, secular scientists, and the sort of topics that they're covering, things like shadow life, um, exoplanets. What's an exoplanet? An exoplanet is a, a planet that's outside of our solar system. Okay. So I mean, you have the top scientists in the world gathering in Rome for the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, it's an audience of the, for the Pope to study life in space. Speaking of studying life in space, how about life on Earth? Uh, Tom, tell me about the hybrid humans. This is one of the things that I didn't even expect would arrive in our study. There is academics who actually believe that there is a hybridity program that is going on right now. And this took me on a kind of a long journey that brought me back to one question, Sid, and that is why in ancient days when the giants, the first original hybrid humans, right, when right. they were created by fallen angels and, and were upon the earth, what was their mission, what was their program? It also had to do with hybridity and it also had to do with misleading and misguiding and even challenging uh, God himself. But notice that the oldest descriptions of those giants, how tall they were, 20 feet, 30 feet, they would be easy to pick up, right? There's a movie out there right now, Jack the Giant Slayer. Uh, and, and it's kind of based on that uh, mythos that exists in every culture around the world. They tell the story, the gods came down, the gods mingled themselves with humans. They took human genetics, animal genetics. They created a hybrid body. Now the question is, down through time, uh, you know, the Bible tells us there were giants in those days and also after that. So now we get past the flood and you have the Og, the king of Bashan. What is he, 12 feet tall? He's certainly not 20 or 30. And it looks to me like there was an intentional breeding down in size of, the, uh, of these hybrid humans until today they could possibly be walking among us and we might not even know uh, that we see them. There, is, there are academics who actually believe now that they are walking among us, that they're even in government. Now, that sounds astonishing. Sounds like a sci-fi movie, right? It does. In fact, why is Hollywood glamorizing all these things at the same time? Well, that's exactly right. So is that part of a setup? Are there occultists in Hollywood that have an agenda to try to help prepare humanity for what could be a, a kind of great deception? Uh, Genesis 6-9 uh, talks about Noah. Explain that. Our research led us to believe that something that happened in ancient days 
could be occurring um, even now as we speak. And when I say ancient days, I'm talking about the days of Noah, a time when all of the ancient records from around the world tell us that very powerful angels came down and they mingled with humans and with uh, animals. The best record is the Bible. The Nephilim is what he's talking about. Go ahead. Absolutely, the Nephilim. And it was a period of time in which only Noah, and therefore by extension his children, mm -hmm. were found, according to the Old Testament, perfect. When you study why the great flood came, the Scripture makes it very clear that it happened because all flesh, both man and beast, had been corrupted. So something was happening in ancient days that had to do with the genetic degradation of God's creation. What does it mean when it says in the Torah about Noah that he was perfect? Yes, this is the Hebrew word temyem means uh, it's the same phrase that's used to describe an unblemished sacrificial lamb. It's talking about genetics. It's talking about the, his DNA had not been corrupted as evidently the rest of the world had been uh, by that time. So there was a saturation, an intermarriage between angels and humans, and then through intermarriage this was spreading uh, over hundreds of years until finally by the time we reach Noah, he's the last specimen left that has a genetic makeup, his DNA, as God had made it. And therefore, you, you understand why God has to send this flood to wipe out all of this contaminated forms of life and sent this judgment in the days of Noah. Now, Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah. Oh, yes. Well, 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 tell, me, tell me this. In the parable of the uh, wheat and the tares, uh, the, the weeds, the wheat and the weeds, uh, the Messiah said, let them grow up together. Don't pull them out. I'm wondering if that's the difference between those whose DNA has not been corrupted and those whose DNA has been corrupted, perhaps through a hybridization process of these aliens. What do you think? You know, Sid, behind the scenes right now, this question uh, is unfolding among academics in a way that you can't even possibly imagine where they're asking the question, do, have we concluded that hybrids are among us? And if hybrids are among us, can they even be saved? This is a complex question that's being raised by theologians right now. Isn't that an astonishing thing? That uh, what's even more astonishing to me is the Vatican's secret plan for welcoming in an alien god with a small g. We'll be right back. I, I, I'll tell you what. Very few Christians... Protestants or Catholics understand what you're about ready to understand right now. But there are secret plans for welcoming. The Vatican will welcome in uh, this alien from another planet as God? Tell me about that. Well, Sid, you know, when you look at Bible prophecy and it talks about a one world government and a one world religion, mm -hmm. you know, you see how divided the world still is. And, you know, we have to think that something Un unprecedented is going to occur that would unite the world under one heading like that. Now, Ronald Reagan gave a speech to the United Nations where he said, how quickly our differences would be resolved if we were faced with an alien threat from outside this world. I mean, this is in the 80s. He gave this hmm. speech in the UN. Now, if you look around the world, what people believe, I mean, statistics in the United States say around 50 percent of Americans already think that UFOs are aliens visiting the Earth. Now, there was a recent poll in the United Kingdom. More people believe in extraterrestrials in the U.K. than God, okay? And that's a, that's a fact. And so, to me, the strong delusion is already here. The groundwork has been laid. And in our, our hypothesis at these powers and principalities that Paul writes about in Ephesians 6, these, these demonic forces have seeded this idea into the world, so we are primed and ready for a deception. Okay, but what, what makes you think the Vatican has planned to announce this? Well, you know, they're having astrobiology conferences. They, they've made it intellectually virtuous to believe in these extraterrestrials. Their writings coming out of their theologians have pretty much made the argument that if you don't believe in extraterrestrials, then that is actually the heresy. You talk about uh, that the Vatican is going to reevaluate their position on 
basic Christianity? What do you mean by that? Well, their theologians have written that they think that these entities will be evangelizing us, that they think the chances are that they're not fallen and we are, so that we would have to modify our beliefs according to their revelation. So are they talking about uh, setting up teams to evangelize humans and aliens? Is that what you're really talking about? Well, if you get on the internet right now, you'll find hundreds, and baptize them? hundreds of articles from the Vatican astronomers talking about baptizing extraterrestrials. A hundred years ago, our top wonderful theologians had predictions based on their study of Scripture. Tell me about Hawkins Pember that wrote about the days of Noah a hundred years ago. George Hawkins Pember was writing in the 19th century, and he found parallels between what he saw in the days of Noah and his age. And, you know, he, he pulled out seven parallels, and there were things like the church marrying itself to the world. Well, and, you know, and I went through Hawk, his list and then compared it to where we are now. Now, everything that he saw in the 19th century has just, you know, exponentially grown. I mean, if you look at like the church married to the world, now we have mainline denominations ordaining homosexual clergy and putting them up as their leadership. But they saw this a hundred years ago. He, it was coming. He did. And the seventh thing on his list was actually the appearance of these entities. And he called them from the prince of the power of the air, which is what Paul calls Satan in Ephesians chapter two. Now, the demonic realm in the New Testament worldview was the atmosphere above the earth. Now, tell me a couple other points that he saw. Well, Pember saw a vast population increase, for one. Now, our population has, has grown by leaps and bounds since something he couldn't even imagine. He saw a confusion of gender roles. Hmm. He was talking about it in the 19th century. Does that century. sound familiar to you? It sounds familiar to me. I don't think he would even have any, you know, inkling of how far that's gone now. I mean, now we have transsexuals, we have, you know, tr homosexual marriages. Uh, what did he say about holiness? He saw that there was a, an emphasis on God um, being benevolent to the extent that they denied his holiness. Now, I think that we see this in this idea of pluralism, which is so popular in our culture where all religions point to the same God. Um, and this is a really acceptable notion in, in today's society, like to talk about hell or eternal punishment or the exclusivity of our Messiah, Yeshua, is the thing that most people don't tolerate. But you see, all these things the Bible says is black and white. They've got to be watered down for there to be a one world religion for people to welcome in an antichrist. I mean, what a setup. Even well, one of the things that he prophesied that you just brought up is a, a, a lack of holiness, a, uh, a lack in belief that there is a hell, uh, a lack in belief uh, uh, that there's even a devil. And, you know, some of these things are surfacing right now. Absolutely. I mean, I even quoted some of the Catholic theologians at Notre Dame who deny that Satan is a real personal power. I mean, they just see him as some sort of abstraction or metaphor for evil. I want you to tell me the strongest thing in all of your research, and you've, you've done both of you, have done extensive research. I want each of you to tell me the strongest thing you found in your research. Well, as I'm listening right now to you and Chris talking, the strongest thing that's in my mind is what, the, again, what Vatican experts have told us when uh, Father uh, Malachi Martin was asked, why is the Vatican, why do they have a presence on Mount Graham? And one of the things we haven't had time to talk about is Mount Graham is sacred to the Apache. It is a stargate through which they, have for centuries, have seen creatures that come, that move back and forth. Now, this is right in Arizona. This is in Arizona. About. And in fact, their creation mythos is that a disc came down and a bearded guy in the disc, who was the father of creation, uh, was what established Mount Graham as a holy mountain. Well, anyway, when Malachi Martin was asked, why is the Vatican on Mount Graham? What are they doing up there? He said that they're using their telescope to watch something. And when he was pressed on the question, he said it's because at the highest levels of the Vatican governance, they know what is approaching the earth, and it will be of the utmost importance importance in coming years. They're literally watching something with the Lucifer device that is approaching planet Earth. And what, what, are, what do you believe they're looking for? Uh, I think that they could
should be deceived. I think they're watching something and they think it's one thing and I think it's something else. Lucifer, I think it's, I think it's Satan. I think Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. He has to do with the power of the air. And of course, you know, when uh, Pope Benedict stepped down not long ago, twice lightning struck the top of the St. Peter's Basilica. And this goes back to their belief system. In Romanism, the belief was that the God would tell you when somebody should step down and when a new king should be elected. It was called augurism, and it's where we take the word inaugural or inauguralism for the placement of a new king. Uh, I'll tell you what, as the kids say, you're blowing my mind, <laughs> but you've got to make Jesus your Lord. Believe he forgave you of your sins. Believe he's your Lord. Welcome him inside now. February 11th of 2013, Pope Benedict XVI announced his resignation from the papacy, something that had not been done in 600 years. Popes always die in office. Later that evening, lightning struck St. Peter's Basilica. It would not be until February 28th that Pope Benedict XVI would step down his final day as Pope. For 13 days, the papacy was empty without a Pope. The conclave met early this week. On the 12th, black smoke appeared uh, out of the chimney, signifying that there was not a decision reached by the cardinals, by the conclave. And, uh, but on the 13th, March 13th, 2013, White smoke appeared out of the chimney, signifying that a pope had been selected. 